for those who went before us and created large footprints. Last night, I tried to lay a little bit of a foundation for a study of history by suggesting that there were several reasons why we should look at history. Put another way, when we are born again, we are born into the family of God. And because that family is multi-generational, the same reasons that would enable you to introduce your children to the wider circle of grandparents and even take them on occasional cemetery visits to talk about their roots and their heritage is one of the reasons why in the body of Christ we look back and try to gain meaning for the present to find out who we are. Therefore, I think discipleship is rooted in a communitarian God who's not just a single solitary person who can be worshipped on a mountainside apart from community. The very revelation of God in the Bible is a God who's three as well as one, a God who's living in community. So discipleship into the family of God is community by its <coughs> essence. And the community of the Christian family is thousands of years old. As First Peter puts it in chapter 2 and verse 9 and following, you were no people. In other words, you were nobody. But now you are somebody. You're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Much of that mercy has been mediated to us by people who translated the Bible, who wrote down the apostles' witness, who um, fought through councils and thousands of boring meetings or took risks to cross oceans and here we are because of them. And so as I say, for us to ignore that is to not only blaspheme the Holy Spirit but really deny the gift of teaching in the church. So I think a mature Christian worldview must look backwards as well as upward and outward uh, to, to get one's head and one's heart around the whole agenda of God. And so that's really part of what we're doing. I tried to suggest last night also that we are trying to build a theology that has integrity and at the same time is accountable to a high view of Scripture. I call this the quadrilateral because it has four poles. I suggested that Thomas Oden, uh, talking about Wesley, had four poles but that I disagreed with them, or, or I added my own uh, missiological contextualization poll. The Bible, the history of the church and its tradition, my own unique experiences as a believer in Christ, coming from the family called Baki, from Norwegian immigrant, living in city, inner city in fact, uh, shapes my experience, how I read the Bible, my Context is a way then of, of affirming that God has agenda in my context. The same God who worked in spite of Pharaoh works in spite of the uh, machine politics in Chicago. I affirm that. Um, I translate Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gate in the Bible, if you read Ruth chapter 4 where the Ruth's husband sitteth in the gates, or Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. Virtuous woman is an entrepreneur who has a husband who sits in the gates. Gates in the Bible city were inside the main gate, and that's where commerce and politics was. So one way you can legitimately translate the Aramaism of Matthew 16, 18 is to say, I will build my church and fifth floor city hall will not be able to stand against it. That's a contextualization that reads the Bible, I think rightly, with due respect to the Aramaic word bab, which means gate. My tradition, American Baptist, rooted in um, some 300 plus years of American history, 1639, my map also includes my Norwegian Scandinavian ancestry, the violent cultures of Europe, et cetera, et cetera, and pietism. My father's patron saint was Hauge, 
a Norwegian Lutheran layman who revitalized the Church of Norway in the 19th century. And uh, so my spiritual pilgrimage, my history, my one-room church where I grew up um, is part of my map. So the hermeneutic that I suggested that I function on is to read the Bible always in dialogue with these realities. And I suggested that one of the things you ought to do is to build your own uh, quadrilateral or its equivalent. You're welcome to borrow mine. All my stuff is copyright. Just copy it right if you want. Uh, but uh, map it. And to say that's me as part of my... Is to look at last night and I'll move on. The Bible really begins with Exodus. Historically, it begins with Exodus. Uh, that may strike you as a, a funny thing to say. Of course, we all know Genesis is the book of beginnings. Not really. Uh, in a sense, it is. I mean, it describes the creation. But Albrecht Alt taught me years ago in his, one of his books that the creation of the people of God called Israel, the history of the family of Abraham, the call of Moses, which led the people out of the wilderness or out of the Egypt into the wilderness, which created the community, then that historically was the conscious group that reached back and collected the stories of Genesis. That is, without the historical community uh, called Israel, there probably wouldn't have been a reaching back to produce the book of Genesis, for example. And so, in a funny sort of way, we can say the Bible begins with the book of Exodus, because Exodus is where the people are called out. Exit means call out. And in an interesting way, the same is true in the New Testament. The apostles, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to meet as a church. And the church existed before the Bible did, before the New Testament did. It was that church that began to write letters. That church began to collect the works of Jesus, the words, and write them down, and so on. And that the Gospels were probably the last parts of the New Testament to be written. The epistles were written first. And it was the church that then uh, had to talk about the faith. And so in both Testaments, historically, the community of the faithful creates the history. I think uh, you can see that. And right away in the Old Testament, you will notice, I think, that there are two themes that run all the way through that Old Testament, and that is the creation and redemption themes. God, the creator, and God, the redeemer. Right? William Temple, uh, the late William Temple, who in 1942 died uh, as a brilliant and quite young Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote a book which really uh, jarred me, uh, Christianity and the Social Order. Temple was a missiologist. He was really a thoughtful person about world mission and wrote some insightful stuff. He was also an evangelical, for which I thank God, not every Anglican Archbishop was. William Temple said, when you open up the Bible, the very first picture of God is he's got his hands in the mud, you know? Is a God in contact with the physical world. It's making the, the universe. The very last picture of God in the Bible, he's sort of cleaning up Lake Erie, PCBs, you know. I've never doubted the millennium will have to be at least a thousand years because it'll take that long to clean up the waste dumps and toxicity that we've <laughs> it created in this planet. The very last picture of God is the recreation of the world after a holocaust, right? The central picture of God in the Bible, said Temple, is a God who is incarnate in real bodies, Christ and ours. Not reincarnation, but resurrection is the key New Testament idea. Now, said William Temple, the point is this. Christianity, then, is not about a God who's a spirit up there. Christianity is the most materialistic religion in the world. 
It's the only religion in which spirit and matter are integrated, fundamentally integrated. If this is so, Christianity is the only religion in the world where salvation of souls and sewer systems and rehab of buildings in urban ministry can be discussed in the same breath. And what God has put together, let nobody pull asunder. On the other hand, the entire history of the Christian church has been the struggle to keep a dualism from emerging that puts the spiritual over the physical. You see it in monasticism, we'll talk about it. You see it in certain sanctification traditions. You'll see it in, in all sorts of ways people talk even today about, well, you know, after all, the most important thing is spiritual. Uh, that is said in such a way to deny and repress often the physical because we're not necessarily comfortable with, with sexuality or with humanity or with the physical uni universe as such. Whenever we deny material, we fundamentally deny something f rooted in the very idea of God. The God of the Bible is a God who's materially involved, so much so he actually takes a human body and <coughs> comes down and occupies our, our family, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, the church has always fought people who said, well, you know, he wasn't really human. I mean, he was sort of a ghost, an apparition, or, you know, he didn't really have all the genes that we have, um, did he? I mean, there's always been an attempt to explain away the incarnation right from the start. And there's always been a sort of strain of evangelicalism that's uncomfortable with the union of the physical and the spiritual. And there's always in liberal tradition a sort of elevation of the physical sometimes over the spiritual. The problem is to be biblical requires us to keep them in tension and to keep them together. And that's why the early Christians fighting Gnosticism developed an, a creed which was the old Roman symbol which became the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. What's the next word? And then, maker of, maker of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. The continuity was held together in the early creed. The, both the maker of heaven and earth. The earth is not an accident any more than heaven is an accident. God is the author of both. And God the Father is impregnated with the stuff of the, the universe and vice versa. Well, you see, that, that is a fundamentally Christian idea. It's very different from, from Hinduism, Buddhism, which have as their whole salvation idea, the idea that you escape from this. Prison, uh, Plato's uh, Fido, which some of you may have read in college. I certainly did. But the allegory of the cave. Uh, Platonic thought is the idea that there's a spiritual hierarchy and that God somehow through a series of eons reaches down and create, lets the world be created, but God isn't really involved in the world. The world is really a trap. Salvation is escape from the physical. And while I know some Christians who talk about heavenly bodies, they really don't ever expect restrooms in heaven or anything like that. But if we're going to eat that banquet all millennium long, we're going to need some. <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? I mean, gee, how you go to that heavenly banquet and not have restrooms. Um, if, you know, I don't know uh, how you feel about that, but that's sort of a symbol to me of our humanity. That's, that's uh, the reality, okay? Uh, and I can celebrate that. I, you know, I'm, that's what creationness means, that we take the whole thing seriously. Uh, and if you believe that, then you can understand the drama of the Bible in which God comes in so many ways to deal with the people. Uh, and, and God uses all kinds of things to achieve the liberation of his people. And um, you can accept then the reality of the world and all of it, even the fallen world and its sinfulness. But if we can't do that, we've got real problems. Now, there are some 
fundamental ideas then, like the, this principle of materialism that I think run all the way through Old and New Testament, implicitly even in the doctrine of the sacraments, that it's real water and it's real bread, that a physical presence, the, the body of Christ is in heaven. Technically, Jesus is in heaven, but he left us physical ordinances or sacraments to remember his spiritual presence by the Holy Spirit. That is, again, a way of uniting the physical and the spiritual. And the, or, the church has always recognized that creation and redemption runs all the way through the Old Testament and the New and even through the history of the church. So, for example, you shouldn't be apologizing for committee meetings. I've been to many, many a committee or board meeting, and people say, isn't this awful that we have to do all this administration in order to do the work of God? I don't believe that. Uh, administration is the work of God. Um, and meetings are the stuff of community. Uh, now, I don't want to baptize bad meetings and unplanned agendas and things like that. But I don't see the bifurcation. Say, you know, if we were just all out preaching, that somehow that's spiritual and that going to meetings is not. I think fundamentally, you see, this is a very important idea. Really fundamentally. It's, it's really nitty gritty stuff we're talking about. Now, what this means is then that I can see God moving through lay people of the Bible and not just the priests. And if you're a layman or woman, you ought to rejoice at this, that the Josephs, the Daniels, the Nehemiahs, the Ruths, the Esthers, the laity of the Bible are the people through whom God is working. And the priests or prophets are those who are called to interpret what God is doing among the laity, all the way through both Testaments. Um, let me talk a little bit about Ruth and Esther again. Both books deal with women. Both are second marriage stories. Both are interracial marriages. Both are very surprising in many ways. Ruth, of course, is a Moabite. And you know where Moabites come from, or do you? The children of Lot. Remember after um, the blasting away of Sodom, um, and by the way, there's a theology of Sodom in Scripture. There are 51 references to Sodom in the Bible, 34 in the Old Testament, 17 in the New. And if you start adding up the references to cities in Scripture, you'll see that there is a theology of city. Not just theology for persons and families, but theology for city. Not just a missiology for the city, but theology for the city. I think that's an important distinction. And the Sodom theology is a very interesting one, out of which, of course, come Lot and his two daughters. The wife didn't make it, as you know. And uh, they moved into the suburban cave, you know. And by the way, I need to remind some of you that sin was invented in a garden, <laughs> not in the city, okay, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and like everything else, it migrated to the city. Okay, just a little subtle idea here. I know people who leave and go to suburbia, uh, which is the old Latin word for suburb, to get away from so-called sin. I just want to remind you that when you leave, you're taking it with you. <laughs> Lot is, is the case in point. When Lot and his daughters moved to the suburb, they got involved in an R-rated chapter there in uh, Genesis 19. Lot, got, uh, Lot was made drunk by his daughters, and he made them pregnant, and one of those incestuous kids turned out to be uh, Moab, Moab and Ammon. And Moab is a parallel motif to Israel all the way through the Bible. Ruth is a Moabite, and in the story of Ruth, which is an interpretation of the judges, and I need to probably draw a little diagram to explain how the Old Testament 
people understood history and how this beautiful book is written because Ruth is in the history book as a commentary on the early history of Israel. In the same way Esther is in the history books of the Bible to comment on the later, as an interpretation of the later history of Israel. The time of the judges was a time when there were seven periods of sin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. And it's really a 430 year period or so in which every, there was no king and every man, says the last verse, was doing what was right in their own eyes. It was during the time of the judges, according to Ruth chapter 1, Ruth is a, a, a motif that runs through this same period. During the time of the judges, that there was a famine in the land of what? Bethlehem. That's a poetic, almost parabolic description because Beth is house, lahem is bread. There was a famine in the house of bread, right in the heart of Israel, right in Bethlehem, there was a famine. That's almost non sequitur, can't happen. There was a famine in the house of bread, which is a commentary on how bad things were during the time of the judges. It was an upside down world. So, Elimelech, which means God is my king, took his wife Naomi, meaning pleasant, and their two kids, Malon and Chilion, which means sick and dying, because there was a vitamin B deficiency in the land, I suppose, the kids were suffering. And they went to Moab to get salvation, okay? Imagine moving to Moab as a kosher Jew to find salvation. And of course, all the men in the story died. God is my king dies. Sure, God is dead. Time of the judges. For all practical purposes, God is dead. Nothing is right. And you end up with two widows. Naomi, of course, in Act 1, Scene 1, she's out on the road. It's sort of an As the World Turns or General Hospital soap opera. Everybody's crying. That's soap operas. The women in the story are crying. And they say, you know, goodbye. Naomi wants to go back home. And Ruth, of course, says, well, I'll go with you. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And, and so in Act 1, Scene 2, the two women start, and they make their, their walk all the way around the Dead Sea back to Bethlehem, a walk two women should never make alone because, remember, it's the time of the judges. Act 1, which is Chapter 1, Scene uh, 3, is where the two women at least a week later, are coming walking into the city. And the women of the city come out and say, could this be? Is, is this possible that this is Naomi? Look at the lines in her face. They've been gone 10 years. Could this be? And she looks him in the eye and says, don't call me Naomi, meaning pleasant. Call me Mara, meaning bitter. And then in Hebrew, you have a pun for the Lord has marred me. Call me Mara, for the Lord has marred me. Call me bitter, for the Lord has embittered me. Chapter 1 has come full circle, okay? And the historical question the author is raising, is life just like all the other Greeks and ancient historians felt? Is history just a circle? Is history just a circle, a vicious circle indeed. It's a philosophy that most people in the ancient world had. Life is just going in circles. Either birth, growth, maturation, decline, death, or spring, summer, fall, winter. The ancient historians were enamored with the idea that history goes in circles or cycles. And Ruth chapter 1 raises the question, is history just cyclical? Is it just going in circles? Ruth chapter 2, or Act 2, Scene 1, it's harvest season and Ruth is uh, being on public aid, is being instructed by her mother-in-law how to cope. And that is that in ancient Israel, you had to go out, every farmer was obligated to leave some of the harvest in the field, the ends of the rows and so on. 
for the poor people to glean. Much more humane policy than our present policies for the poor. Uh, and anybody could go into anybody's field. And so Naomi says, now you go out there. And um, she knew, of course, whose field it was that she was going to go to. And she really set her up. And chapter two has this wonderful change of ambience. It's chapter one. Verse three, her hap was, that's the King James Version, it just so happened that she went into the field of Boaz, who just happened to be the most eligible bachelor in Israel, and just happened to be love at first sight. And so in Act 2, Scene 1, Ruth is being instructed. Act 2, Scene 2, she goes into the field. Act 2, Scene 3, Boaz is telling his people, look, <laughs> I mean, love has really gotten to this guy. He's, he's now throwing away the prophets. He, he's very discreet, but he sends his staff out to throw extra grain in front of Ruth so she can pick up a lot of grain without even knowing it. And then he instructs them, you know, if you lay one finger on her, I'll wring your neck kind of thing. Good theology. And so Ruth is blissfully picking just all to her, it's an accident. And she goes home, scene four, act two, and she has eight ephods of grain, and her mother-in-law says, wait a minute, this is no accident. But chapter two raises a question, is history just chance? Is it just a series of, hey, she just happens to go in the right field, she just happens to fall in love? Is that what history is about? Chapter three could be subtitled, How to Get a Husband. Ruth has been going out in the field every day, but she's still uh, not getting any closer to marriage. And unfortunately for Ruth, Boaz has only seen her in her working clothes. And so Ruth, uh, she gives Ruth this mother-in-law, daughter conversation. She says, Ruth, take a bath, <laughs> point one. Secondly, anoint yourself with perfume. Good perfume, probably midnight in Moab, or something that, <laughs> something like that. And and three, put on your new dress. Um, now that's very interesting. That's all there. And the author is ah, so this is how it works, huh? And then Ruth says now, or Naomi says now, you go out there at quitting time today. Now, the threshing floor is really a level spot in the side of a mountain. And all the wheat is brought together and it's placed on this in a pile. And if you're rich, you have a donkey or something walking around tramping out the, uh, the grain. And then at night, at six o'clock, the breezes come up from the Dead Sea on a Galilean hillside. And, um, and then the chaff flows over the side, and the grain pile builds right here. And we know this is the case. It's still that way. And then, um, of course, the owner has to sleep there before morning. The grain exchange in Bethlehem had closed. And the owner would have to sleep there beside the bed, you know, because um, it's the time of the judges, and you, your grain would be stolen before morning. Naomi knows all this. She's a native. And so she says, look, you'll be sleeping behind the grain pile. At, he, he'll take a little wine to sort of give him antifreeze for the night, but you sneak up on him and uncover him. You know, just leave him sort of exposed there at midnight, and then you just sit here, okay? And then at midnight, he'll wake up shivering, he'll see you, and he'll propose. <laughs> <laughs> this raises a very fundamental question. Is history a conspiracy? <laughs> right? Man, it worked. Just like, and a very chaste veil is brought over the story. It's a wonderful story. As I said, it's the closest thing we have to a biblical soap opera. And each chapter has its own ambience, and each chapter is a philosophy of history. History is a circle. It's just going in circles. That's what it looked like. History is just chance. Hey, it just things happen by chance. Random accidents. That's history. 
Ah, history's conspiracy. The sort of golden rule is do unto others before you get done by, you know? Go get them. Uh, and here's how you do it. Well, it worked. Uh, chapter 4 uh, is <coughs> Act 4, Scene 1. Uh, Boaz, uh, he can hardly believe his excitement. He's going to town to announce his engagement. And in Jewish uh, fashion, uh, in ancient days, you had to post at the city in the gate, you had to post your announcement. Now, Ruth came with inheritance rights. Um, Leveret marriage laws, love isn't very important in ancient Israel, but the land is important. So whoever married Ruth gets to redeem Naomi's property. Uh, that's the stickler. I mean, what it meant was you couldn't just get Ruth's land. The land wouldn't go to your kids. If you, if you married, let's say you wanted to marry Ruth, the land would always reside in her family history, the maternal side of the family. It would never retreat, never go to your side, the man's side. So most, this is a wonderful rule in some ways to protect the rights of women, but it didn't mean, mean that some people were never married because people would talk to their accountant or something and decide they couldn't afford to marry Ruth. You know, it just didn't figure on the tax forms to their advantage. So Boaz, who doesn't need a tax write-off, he's wealthy enough, he, he posts, posts the engagement on the board and waits because he knows there's one person who's more eligible to redeem Ruth and the land than he is. And that's the near redeemer who comes in, the near kinsman. He's the cousin who comes in and he looks at the wedding announcement, goes to talk to his accountant and decides, I guess, he can't afford her uh, for various reasons and he decides not to redeem her and Boaz Whoopee, you know, he's got a wife. Okay, that's act four, scene one. Scene two is a baby shower. It's some months later now, and Ruth in Naomi's home has all the women in chapter one, you know. All the women come to this baby shower. And they're all passing little baby Obed around the circle. They name him baby Obed. Obed means servant servant in Hebrew and they say we're going to call him Obed because he's going to serve the needs of your family. The book ends with a list of names, okay, ten names and that's the key to the book. That's what gives us a clue as to how to read the book. The last four names are Obed, who's going to grow up and have a big kid and what's Obed's name going to be? Obed's kid, Jesse. Jesse. And Jesse's going to grow up and be a big boy someday, and he's going to have a kid, and his kid's name? David. David. Period. End of book. Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. What's the point? Is history just going in circles? Is it just chance? Is it conspiracy? Uh-uh. History is going toward a goal. The goal is to produce the salvation of Israel. You just think during the time of the judges. You just wake up in the morning as though nothing else is happening. You look at the headlines. Man, it's circle, chance. Just one more bad political election coming up. Nothing's changing, right? The commentary is this list of names. This raises the question, is history providential? And the answer is a screaming yes. History is going someplace. History has a goal. It is a redemptive goal. And that the God of the Bible is the God who can use the cycle, the chance, the accidents, the conspiracies.
And that, you know, this reminds me of the, the second verse of the Christmas hymn, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given when God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. Now, Ruth, then, is this little gem stuck in the middle of this chaotic judges to be a commentary on Israel's history, you see? That's, that's why it's there. It's a commentary on that chaotic history of the judges. It unlocks it. It gives us a window, a hermeneutical window, to ask the question, how does one look at the chaos of Iran and the Gulf, or Palestinian struggle, or if you're a Christian in South Africa and you live in Soweto, is God producing the child? Is it my child? Is it some other child? How is God moving to deliver his people? Is it just one more cycle of oppression or accident or conspiracy, you see? Or is there a redemptive plan going on even now that we don't even know about? I mean, would you have guessed that this is how God was doing it? It didn't look any different from any other baby history, right? But that's the clue. And I share this story with you because that's how we understand biblical history. Is that God works through the sort of physical to achieve the spiritual. That, that they're intertwined and that they always have been. And that's part of the biblical worldview. Is that this commentary, Little Ruth, becomes the sort of legitimate window through which we say, Aha! History is moving somewhere. It's going to a redemptive goal. Now, the New Testament begins, Jesus Christ, son of David. David. You see, Ruth becomes the great-grandmother, many times over, of the new deliverer, Jesus. And the genealogies are stylized in Matthew 1 and Luke 2 to connect Jesus to this history. And so they give us permission, you see, to see how the history functions. Now Esther, put simply, is a similar kind of, of history. It's a history, it's a commentary on Israel's diaspora, where Israel is dispersed and now they're living, not in the promised land, but in Esther, the people of God are living in dispersion and absolute despair because they're, they're in Persia. And not only are they in Persia, they're, they're like Jews in Germany about to experience the Holocaust, right? And in an amazing story, a woman wins the Miss Persia beauty contest, becomes a member of the harem, has a cousin Mordecai, now that isn't the whole, I haven't told you the whole part of the story. Who is Mordecai? He's a descendant of King Saul. Who is Haman? He is a descendant of the Agite who, followed, who fought against King Saul. One of the lessons of um, the theology of Esther is that sin is not personal only. It's corporate and it institutionalizes. And what was personal sin at the time of Moab? Uh, remember when Moab, um, remember when um, Moses petitioned to be able to go through Edom and Am Moab and Ammon and use the King's Highway, the ancient road? And remember what the Ammonites said? Nothing doing, you're not gonna use our road. You should know that Moses was a descendant of, um, of Mordecai, and the people who refused to let him use the road were descendants of, uh, of Haman. The conflict that shows up in Esther had been festering in it, between Israel and the ancient world for centuries. So the conflict between persons is a conflict between institutions. That's, a, that's an understanding of how we view sin, is that sin isn't just personal, it's corporate. It's, it's an evil that gets institutionalized. And so part of the understanding of sin in the Bible is, is how we read ex, uh, Esther. Now, I mentioned last night that 
Mordecai says in Exodus, in uh, Esther 4, 4 and following, perhaps this is why you were elected queen. Maybe God is going to use you as the deliverer, only he doesn't mention God. It's a very secular time. Esther is, like Ruth, a commentary on how God works when everything is ambiguous. It's a history of how God moved to deliver his people when there were no prophets, no priests, no temple, no Sabbath. Nobody seemed to be concerned about God, and God is never mentioned in the book. But through politics and the art of the possible, even in a pagan culture, God brings about the redemption of his people. Esther is a very encouraging book to those of us who live in a secular, chaotic, urban world. Because it shows us that even if you're a public health mother, a public aid mother, trapped in a bad marriage or no marriage, uh, that God can be working through you. Okay? It's a book for public aid mothers. It's a book for people who live in bad marriages, who are like the woman in John 4, they've slept with the whole village, you know, sort of Elizabeth Taylor of the village, like the woman at the well. Um, there are social pariahs. Um, they wouldn't be invited to serve on the board of your organization. They wouldn't be able to be staff of navigators. Uh, and they wonder if God can use them. Esther is eloquent on this point. Of course God can use you. And perhaps, in fact, your whole series of bad marriages can be offered up to God as Esther proves that God is able to use a person in this very ambiguous situation. Now, you see, this is theological reflection. It's not thou shalt or thou shalt not. And it's certainly not modeling. I mean, it doesn't say go and be like Esther get into a bad second marriage and join a harem. That's not the point of the book. The point of the book is this clue, this window. It's not a list of names in Esther. The clue is in Mordecai's comment. Perhaps this is why, you see. Now, both of these books then are history books and they are commentaries on Israel's history. And that's how they must be understood. They give us permission to reflect on the ambiguities of Israel's historical situation. Now, the interesting thing is that when I pick up the evangelical commentaries on Esther, I am very disappointed mm -hmm. because every single one usually comes out of people who say, I believe the entire Bible is inerrant, and yet they spiritualize this book. Frankly, evangelicals don't know what to do with Esther, but I have news for you. Neither did the Dead Sea community. Esther was the one book that the people in the Dead Sea Qumran community refused to put in their Bible. I mean, Queen Esther was just off their map. They didn't see how a person like that or a book like that could be included in the Bible. The Origenites, uh, origin of uh, Alexandria and others, found another way to include, they just allegorize the whole thing. They just give it sort of a, a meaning that has nothing to do with history. The point is, it is a history book. That's why the Jews included it in the history, to give a commentary on the history. So I wanted you to see how the Bible treats uh, history. Let me also throw another aspect of this at you. Robert Gordas, who wrote a, a number of books, he's a rabbi and very scholarly, uh, was in Cincinnati for many, many years, may still be. I don't know, I've never read that he died. He could be dead, he's, he would be old if he's alive. But he wrote a book, a commentary on Ecclesiastes called Koalith, and it's a Hebrew commentary and the introduction is worth the price of the book, in which he says, he tells a story. Let me, let me tell this sort of story. Uh, in my own words that he tells in the, preface, in the introduction to the book. He said, if I went down the street of old Jerusalem and I met an old prophet, or an old priest first, I met an old priest and I say, old priest, tell me, when are the good days? 
the old priest would think about it for a moment, and then his eyes would glaze over. He'd be filled with nostalgia, and he'd say, oh, back when we were in the wilderness, when God was taking care of us, those were the good days. When we remembered the exodus and we were living on manna, trusting God completely after the baptism of the Red Sea, those were the good days. It's been downhill ever since. Now, says Gordas, the divine library, by which he means Old Testament, has a genre of literature that it looks backward to the great acts of God in the past. That's the sort of historical material collected and brought forward. And it's clued into remember, remember when, Hosea, remember when you were in the wilderness? Remember when we were courting and I was your God and you were my people? Remember, remember, remember. Now, Gorda says, I continue down the street of old Jerusalem and I meet the old prophet. And I say, old prophet, when are the good days? And he thinks for a moment and his eyes glaze over and he gets nostalgic and he says, ah, oh, when Messiah comes, when justice reigns in the earth, no more sickness, no more death, no more war, those are the good days. And Gordas says, I have to tell you in the Divine Library, there's a body of literature that looks forward to the deliverance and the end and the glorious future. Then he says, I continue down the street of old Jerusalem and I meet the old sage, the Hebrew poet, the author of Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Solomon. And, and uh, I say, old poet, old wise man, when are the good days? And he thinks a moment. Finally, he throws up his hands and says, enjoy, enjoy. It'll never get better. It'll never get worse. And said Gordas, there is a body of literature in the Bible for the meantime, <laughs> which is a mean time between the great acts of God in the past and the great acts of God in the future. It's especially true after the exile, when the people come back to Jerusalem and they have to rebuild it, and they all around them are the ruins of the great past. But there are no prophets, and there's no deliverance for the present. So the practical theology movement of, of ancient Israel was the poetry tradition of the wisdom books of the Bible, the wisdom literature, the sort of Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes. I sort of look at Ecclesiastes as, whatever, as the critique of liberal arts education. You know, sort of the Hebrew vanity of vanity, yeah. Nothing new under the sun. A sort of critique of the liberal art tradition, Ecclesiastes. Um, Song of Songs is subtitled What Every Little Girl Ought to Know. You know. And maybe uh, Proverbs is what every little boy ought to know, something like that, you know, and very practical stuff. Do this, do that. Well, I think that's interesting because Gordas is saying that there is in the Bible a pluralistic worldview of a past and a future integrated into the present. And I think that gives meaning. That helps me understand the point of those texts. I pastored in a bad neighborhood where the ruins of the, the good days are all around us. And I was there for 10 years, and it got worse every year in the neighborhood. And I read Gordas, and I said, aha, that's it. I'm living in the days after the exile when we're having to rebuild the neighborhood. And the practical theology movement is, again, how you survive in the city, as it was for Nehemiah and in those days of Israel. You see, the, the whole understanding of the Old Testament historically then can be read into how we live today. And there's so much more. Think historically with me some more. I hope you don't get tired of thinking historically. When God dis enabled Babylon to destroy Jerusalem, you know what got destroyed? That magnificent temple and the priesthood and the kingship. And Israel's people were thrown to the wind, yes, they were thrown into Babylon, Babylonia, living in ghettos. They didn't have a temple, they didn't have priests, they didn't have Sabbaths, so you know what they did? They invented the synagogue 
They'd never needed it before. The synagogue is a gift of the exile. And the synagogue movement is a parachurch lay movement. The synagogue tradition is a sort of navigator model of a lay movement in diaspora. The gift, then, of the destruction of the city is the invention of the very model which created for the Apostle Paul the wonderful spread of the gospel. I mean, imagine, Paul used, he played synagogues like people play electronic video games. I mean, Paul went from synagogue to synagogue, and much of the conversion of the early church was organized around synagogues. You see it? Think historically then. God used the destruction of the temple to create the synagogue. In the temple, there was a Shekinah glory. And do you know the people in Jerusalem basically had forgotten about angels? You don't need angels when you live in Jerusalem. You got the Shekinah glory there. God's presence is there all the time. When they got over there in Babylon, guess what? They also recovered what they had lost theologically. They recovered the doctrine of angels. And in Daniel and Nehemiah, suddenly you find angels reemerging in Israel's theology. So dispersion is a gift viewed historically. The scattering of the people is going to generate whole new methods and possibilities for reaching the world in evangelism. If I view this history right then, let me continue. The, the Jews were put in Alexandria, right? Alexandria was a Greek city on the Nile Delta. It was a city which Philo said was 70% Jewish. And he said, quote, they live in poverty and they work in industry. And it was in Alexandria that the kids started coming home after school talking street Greek, sort of shuck and jive <laughs> of the first century. They were, the kids were coming home and instead of speaking Masoretic Hebrew, they were speaking sort of Swahili trade language, okay? Sort of an empty language, street Greek, koine. Not beautiful classic koine, just sort of see puff, oh look see, see puff run. You know, it's sort of <laughs> elemental language. It's like in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, very simple language. And you can imagine meetings down at the old synagogue, right? What are we going to do about this? And I wonder who was the first harebrained guy who probably was voted out of the synagogue who said, why don't we translate the Bible into street Greek? He was probably lined up and shot. Heresy, heresy, I mean the, the, the Torah, the Talmud, the sacred words of Hebrew, oh, <laughs> pain, sorrow, suffering. I mean, if, if they made even a copying error, they had to destroy the manuscript and take a bath. Imagine <laughs> writing the sacred word in shuck and jive so that the kids are rap, all right, putting the sacred scripture in a wrap so the kids would keep the faith. Man, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is a gift of an ethnic community in a Greek city struggling on this very question. What language are we going to use? And can the sacred mysteries of the heavens be translated ultimately? I mean, think of Isaiah. The vocabulary of Isaiah in Hebrew is greater than the entire New Testament vocabulary in Greek combined. I mean, Luke and Paul had fair-sized vocabularies, okay? Well-educated people. Luke, Paul, John, Matthew, the whole New Testament has a smaller vocabulary than Isaiah. Now, that, Isaiah was something else. Imagine taking Isaiah, the rip, rich passages, and putting them in trade language Greek. And yet without this, what would Paul have had to preach in the Greek world? 
You think that's an accident? It's a historical fact, but you know what, it el what else it is? It's also a hermeneutical window that lets me ask, what is God doing today in the city when, la when ethnic congregations are coming in and struggling with language questions again? And every congregation is struggling with this issue. Should we continue to speak the old country language? What are we going to do about our kids? You see, the, the historical issues here are very practical and pastoral, aren't they? For me to be able to stand up to the church and say, you know, this is not a new issue. God's people way back in Alexandria struggle with this same issue. And this is how they responded. This is how they dealt with it. And I think that gives us the permission to have Spanish in the church because we need to reach the people who've come. And the Alexandrian community became bilingual. And as we look at that, we say, well, I guess that's the way it'll have to be done, you see. The history gives permission, and the history becomes a gift. To ignore that, as I say, is to ignore some stuff you need if you're going to work with ethnics today. That history is critical to understanding how we help people who are living in these sorts of situations. We've got about seven or eight minutes to a break. Habakkuk, of course, is another interesting bit of history because here uh, you have Babylon destroying Israel. And the prophet saying, you know, I believe in spanking, but this is ridiculous, Lord. I mean, Israel needed spanking, but how can you, you know, how on earth could you allow a pagan government like Babylon to defeat us good guys, Israel, forever and ever? The why questions there historically are not unlike saying, could God ever allow the Russians to purify America? Do you suppose the God who allowed Israel to be purified with the Babylon could ever stomach the idea that maybe the Russians will have to be called upon to purify the American church? Oh, I can conceive of it, folks. I can raise that question, not that I would like it, but you see, I have to raise a question because Habakkuk is raising that question. That's a historical question. The prophet, seeing this happen, says, I can't believe this. I mean, we're the chosen people. Babylon is the arch enemy of sin, and you're allowing them to conquer us? What's the purpose of that? How, what's this history about? And you know what? The prophet finally says, oh, I see it now. The just shall live by faith, not by American foreign policy and defense budgets. We live by faith. The phrase which Romans picks up is picked up from Habakkuk, but it's almost never connected in American Christianity and discipleship, which is that, hey, God doesn't need a Pentagon budget. God doesn't need a fortress America to reach the world. In fact, maybe in spite of all the good coming out of this country, in spite of all the missionary dollars that are raised here, I can conceive of the fact that God may sometime just throw up his hands and let us be defeated and purged. And we'll say, how come? And then we'll say, oh, I see. We'll live by faith and not by privilege, not by exotic budgets and Colorado Springs headquarters. <laughs> all, those things, all those little perks. Right? See, the history... Well, somebody said, A.J. Gordon, in fact, said, a good sermon should do two things. It should afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. I hope I've done both. I think the history does that. It really raises wonderfully comforting questions. Isn't this a marvelous story? What, how encouraging could you possibly be? Habakkuk is not my idea of comfort. Jonah was not exactly popular either, you know. He... <laughs> here's, here's a foreign missionary book. God calls the prophet Jonah and says, go northwest. I mean, go northeast to Nineveh, one of the three ancient capitals of the ancient empire of Assyria. The prophet says, now, wait a minute. Do you know, God, 
about their foreign policy? Right. Foreign policy of Assyria was to destroy Israel. They'd been trying it for years. They sent conquerors like Sennacherib, Shalmaneser, Sargon, and Tiglath-Pileser. The whole book of Kings in the Bible is this holy war between Assyria and, uh, and Israel. And Assyria wins and takes the whole northern ten tribes into captivity, end of northern tribes, and they start conquering the southern tribes. And would have conquered them, except Babylon devoured them. <laughs> and Israel's <laughs> applauding, and then whoop, you know, they got it too. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, that's 30-second introduction to the books of Kings Chronicles in the Bible. <laughs> All the rest is fine print. Um, and then God called the prophet Jonah. He was the only prophet still alive. <laughs> he had plenty to do. God says, I want you to go up there and tell them I really don't like their foreign policy. I really don't like their sin, the way they're treating the world. <laughs> Jonah went down and bought a one-way ticket straight west. And God gave him the round trip. That's mm -hmm. essentially the Jonah story. And, you know, it's so interesting. Jonah goes down and, and there's this ecumenical prayer meeting on the ship. <laughs> Uh, every man is crying out to their own God. And, and so this guy comes up and says, hey, how come you're missing the ecumenical prayer meeting? I mean, you know, maybe it's your God that's got the solution. And Jonah finally realizes he'd been had and he was the problem and he confessed it. And here's one of two cases in the Old Testament where prophets committed suicide. The other was Elijah's wish for death in 1 Kings 19. Anyway, he says, throw me overboard. Now, this pagan crew had more compassion than Jonah did. They threw the cargo overboard to save him, but it still didn't work. So finally they threw him overboard, and this giant guppy swallowed him. <laughs> and he goes to the bottom of the sea. And then the most interesting thing occurs. The whole, fish, the whole load of sailors gets converted. You talk about mass evangelism, this was it. They all made vows to Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. This is one of the most interesting evangelism methods in the whole Bible. <laughs> you want to deliver this? Just jump overboard, have a swish fish swallow you. And all these pagan sailors who were ecumenical have now become believers in the true God. Isn't that an interesting? Have you ever strategized in navigators about how that might work as a strategy? <laughs> You want to be biblical, don't you? Well, here's one of the great evangelism experiences of the whole Old Testament. And it doesn't even get mentioned in most evangelism books, and I've never quite figured out why. <laughs> well, the second chapter is a prayer meeting in a whale's belly. This Jonah is down there quoting Psalms at the fish until he dies. In fact, there's some feeling that maybe he died and that uh, he got resurrected. Um, but anyway, ch chapter 2, verse 10 is my favorite verse. Um, the verb is wonderful. And the fish blah, vomited out Jonah on the beach. Now, when, a f when we eat bad fish and get sick, it's called botulism. I don't know what it, you call it when a fish eats a bad man and gets sick. <laughs> <laughs> but then, here in the vomit of a sick fish lies the prophet, the urban prophet Jonah, right? And unless that fish belt him, belched him over two mountain ranges, he's still got a long way to walk. And, and of course, now you know why you got a crowd in Israel, all a little, you know, I mean, a few days in a sick fish will do wonders for your breath <laughs> and your skin and your clothes. And I, I just have visions of all those kids coming and saying, Mommy, I'll never guess what's on our street. <laughs> and, and Jonah would have no problem getting attention. Well, in the book of Jonah, Chapter 3, if, if chapter 1 is Jonah's pouting and chapter 2 is his prayers and chapter 3 is preaching. His preaching is very interesting. It's like a lot of preaching I hear. Repent! In 40 days you're going to hell! And in his heart he's saying, I can hardly wait. You know. So, but even half a gospel is enough to convert the Assyrians. A scare theology. And, and they all get converted. And so chapter 4, Jonah's up on the mountain with his little fireworks booth. He's, he's uh, sitting under this plant in the shade there, having his devotions from Genesis 18, I'm sure. Lord says here, you blew up Sodom. Lord, do it again. I believe you can do it again. And he's, he's there. And, and the same God who made that gigantic guppy made a little worm and sent the worm into his little plant that he'd been so carefully watering. And the whole plant 
collapses and you know, I give up. I can't believe it. You don't care about me at all. Now, the book of Jonah ends with Jonah giving, a, uh, with God giving, uh, asking a question. He says, Jonah, shouldn't I care about a city in which there are 120,000 babies? That's the Mideast proverb. 120,000 you don't even know from their right, from their left hand, and much cattle. Cattle in the Middle East is the economy. Cattle is economy. He owns the economy on a thousand hills. Okay? And so the question at the end of the book of Jonah is, shouldn't I care? Now, Jonah's got a problem. If God had blown up the city, Jonah gets to go back to Israel and say a wonderful thing happened. The people got saved, then they got judged. You know, they got blown up. Wonderful. Jonah would have gotten a ticker tape parade up the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem. There would have been a new song. You know, Jonah has killed more with his preaching than David had with his armies. <laughs> He'd be a major prophet instead of a minor prophet. <laughs> It'd be a big statue on the Temple Mount. Here's Jonah, the great Jonah. But now he's got to go back and tell the people of Israel that the God of the Bible has done a terrible thing and that there are now more Assyrians in heaven than, than Jews. <laughs> and you're going to be a minority up there. And that's what you got to look forward to. The salvation of this God is very strange. We are elect people, but we're not in charge of anything. That's why Jonah's a minor prophet, and there's only one verse mentioned about him in the book of Kings. They couldn't hear that message. The, the message of a God that loves the whole world. And I think a lot of Americans would be just appalled if a revival breaks out in Russia. Billy Graham told me that he, I had an interesting conversation with him about Russia. He said, uh, there, is, there is a revival so deep and so wide in Russia that the, the Politburo doesn't know what to do. He said he spent an hour and 20 minutes with the Politburo. No American has ever spent an hour and 20 minutes. And that he had supper with the Reagans the night before he was telling me this. He said, uh, he was, he's saying that they just don't know what, what to do in Russia with this revival. Now, there are probably more evangelicals now in Russia than in the United States. There may be more evangelicals in China than in the United States. We know there are more Christians now in the world that are black, brown, and yellow than white. Okay? Because the revivals in Africa, Latin America, and Asia have made it so. I think Americans be horrified to hear that good news. <laughs> hey, you mean heaven isn't going to be a white place like Wheaton? I mean, <laughs> you're going to have open housing up there? Our kids going to go to school with them? Right? You see, Israel is dealing with all these issues. And this is practical theology, okay? This is this is the stuff that we read biblically and historically, and this is how we need to communicate it, I think. We need to, to make it clear. Well, we need to take a break. Then I want to come back and talk a little bit about the New Testament and the early church. So I think we have about 15 minutes.